I'm going to go ahead and get us started. And I know more um, of our friends and, 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 and family members are going to be joining us. So um, we're so grateful that you're here with us tonight. Again, please drop your name and where you're calling in from into the chat box so we know who's with us and we can just feel a little cozy. Um, I'm Robert Kell. I'm the new economy program manager with Appalachian Voices. I've been with um, Appalachian Voices for almost a year now, and I'm on the, the wonderful new economy team. And I work um, almost daily with the folks who are on our panel tonight. And it's just a real pleasure to just dive into conversation with them. Um, we're actually celebrating our 25th anniversary, Appalachian Voices is, and this is just one of the many ongoing conversations that um, is happening this year. Um, we get to go first, which is really exciting, so we get to set the bar really high for all of the events that are going to be coming for the rest of the year. Um, but we just want to say really upfront um, how grateful we are to um, all of the donors, volunteers, partners, and staff members who make our work happen every single day. So if you are one of those folks or you're just here to learn more about us, maybe you'll soon be a volunteer or just a partner with us. We're so grateful for the work that um, each of you um, allows um, the momentum of our work to, to continue. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves. And I'm going to start with Adam and then go to Christine, then Matt, then Lou, and then Chelsea will let you introduce yourself too. So um, again, without further ado, Adam, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Robert. Hi, everyone. We're glad that you're with us. I'm Adam Wells. I'm the Director of Community and Economic Development with Appalachian Voices, work in our Norton, Virginia office with Robert and Chelsea, who's also here. Um, and yeah, we're just so glad that you're with us celebrating our, uh, our 25th anniversary of Appalachian Voices. Um, it, it's April 25th. We're doing these things on the 25th um, to try and be fun because we like to have fun. Um, just real quick about the new economy program, um, which is based out of our Norton, Virginia office. It was started uh, in 2015, uh, seven years ago, around this um, idea that uh, Appalachian Voices want to be part of the solution, part of the, the new economy that needs to be built, that we are building in central Appalachia um, in response to the decline of, of the coal industry and all the other uh, fossil fuel related industries of the past that um, many of us are really proud of, but we need to look forward to the future to build a new economy based on new energy and um, bring as many people together to do that as we can. Um, uh, we do that work uh, out of our Norton Virginia office around um, some key areas of work. Um, one is our uh, solar development work. Um, some of y'all may be familiar with the solar work group of Southwest Virginia. That's how really everyone on this call is involved in, in that. Um, Christine uh, with Dialogue and Design helps to facilitate that and Matt with Secure, Secure Futures helps with our build out of solar. Um, so it's one is solar development. We also work in coal land um, reclamation and, and redevelopment, and community development around coal impacted areas. And that's one of the ways that we work with Lou uh, in the community of Daint, which I'm sure we'll talk about soon. Um, and then through all that, we do a lot of community organizing, uh, community building. Um, and so really working to build a regenerative um, community-based new economy based on those two key industry sectors and many other connected ones. So excited to get into the details of what all that means. Um, and I'll, I'll go ahead and pass it on. Who's going next, Robert? Christine, you're up. Christine, passing it to Christine. Great. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Robert. And thanks for the opportunity to be here. It's a delight to be here with all of you today. Looking forward to our conversation. Can you all hear me okay? Great. So my name is Christine Govey. I'm with Dialogue and Design Associates. We're going on our 17th year, believe it or not, of, of the business. And we do facilitation, community engagement, and architectural work focused in two kind of primary geographies, Central Appalachia and the Chesapeake Bay, but we work on projects nationally as well. And the role that I um, really have the delight in is, is helping to move community conversations forward. So at the core, we really help communities envision their future and find tools and resources to make it happen. And all the work that we do around community engagement is really centered around local leaders and local ideas. And that's something we firmly hold to be true is around kind of getting into content. So I'll bring it back up, but it is really core to the work that resilience is built on the local ideas of local leaders. Um, I've been working in Southwest Virginia since about 2009. Um, 
And I love Southwest Virginia. It's one of my very, very favorite places to work because I have never <laughs> worked with such a fun group of people who are so dedicated, willing to roll their sleeves up. Um, I think in the community that Lou Ann lives, there is a sign. I don't think it's there anymore, Lou, that said, you know, um, something like, instead of complaining, roll your sleeves up and, and get the work done, something like that. And I think that that sign really by the playground really embodies a lot of the spirit in Southwest Virginia. Um, my own background, um, I'm the granddaughter of a coal miner and firefly scientist, teacher and a postmaster. Some of those family members from Southern West Virginia for a couple generations. And that background deeply informs the work that I do today, really focused on positive solutions. Um, my husband reads from Charleston, West Virginia, and in grad school, we made a film about mining in a lot of the communities my family's from, and it really helped us see the uncelebrated stories that are often taking place in communities as well, and just really opened my mind to the change that everyday community members are making, and that's really a big emphasis of my work now, is really helping to share out the stories of amazing people creating remarkable change in their communities like Lou Ann and like Appalachian Voices and like Secure Futures and like other partners who are just rocking and rolling in their communities in ways that inspire others and create real change and are really working towards a resilient future. So it's a real honor for me to work with a lot of the folks on the call today. And we do that through really helping to work towards solutions. So in Southwest Virginia, it's solar. In other places in Virginia, it's around watersheds and living shorelines, but it's, it's a real joy and it really is based on local community. And I have a podcast, just got to plug it, yesweride.org, where you can hear stories of some of the folks on the um, panel today being interviewed. So thanks again, Robert. Thanks, Christine. Matt, you're up. All right. Well, my name is Matthew McFadden, and I'm the Business Development Associate for Secure Futures in uh, Western Virginia from Roanoke uh, to Lee and, uh, West, and West Virginia uh, from about Midway Point down. Um, my job would not be possible without all the other people uh, you see on this panel. Um, the solar work group's been working since about 2016 to get solar in the region. And uh, I was lucky enough to get involved with Secure Futures and involved with this project back in 2020. And uh, since then, we had the first two schools in Southwest Virginia go solar. Uh, construction should be happening this, uh, this, this summer. And uh, with that, we are reaching out to other folks in the region, um, community leaders, uh, people like Lou, uh, other school districts, businesses, commercial areas to try to, to pick up solar as, as things go forward. In addition to that, we are uh, doing some great workforce development opportunities, uh, creating about eight new jobs, permanent jobs this year, and have an apprenticeship program for the local school districts that have signed up to go solar, where we're uh, able to give those kids uh, some pretty good money, about $17 an hour, nine hours of college credits, uh, much more than that, a couple certifications. But I'm, uh, I'm just happy to try to reinforce the, uh, the uh, job creation here in Southwest Virginia, help solar move forward. And uh, being local here all my life, I've seen what uh, the devastation that uh, the loss of jobs did back to us in the uh, late 2000s. So I look, to, look forward to bringing some more jobs back, some more savings to our schools, and uh, some more opportunities for uh, my fellow Appalachians. Thanks, Matt. I was looking for the reaction button, and, and there's not one on um, the panel webinar. So I'll just give <laughs> um, excited hands for um, solar on schools and for the apprenticeship program. Thanks for your work. Um, Lou, you're up. Wonderful. And, and it's lovely to be here tonight with everyone from across the, the nation, right? So I'm looking at some folks over here to see where you're from. I'm impressed. So welcome to uh, my world, which I'm sitting here smack in the geographic center of good old Southwest Virginia. And so there's a little twang, so you'll just have to bear with me. Uh, my name is Luann Wallace, and um, my big uh, title tonight is volunteer because that's the one that gives me the very most pleasure of all. But I do wear a lot of hats, and so I'll start with a simple one. I started a nonprofit about 20 years ago called St. Paul Tomorrow. That segued after about $25 million in investments uh, in a small town of less than 1,000 people. That segued over into uh, various things, um, mostly in the environmental world. 
and I found myself on State Water Control Board and for Virginia and also president of Virginia Soil and Water. And um, so I understand fully a lot of things and I don't know a thing about other things. So I'm, a, I'm not a master of anything, let's put it that way. But anyway, um, I have the heart and soul of a volunteer. And that's what I think the major topic here tonight is to move the needle forward. That's what it's gonna take because it's gonna take all the experts that we're talking to tonight. And I am uh, thrilled and humbled to be amongst uh, this beautiful panel that I have worked with and I have depended on and I call my friends and they have entered my circle of friends and they're shaking their heads. So I use my friends, I abuse my friends and that's how we get it done. Um, so I will leave it at that so we can dive into the meat of the session and, and waste no time on Lou. It's a pleasure to be here though, thank you. Lou, you're just an incredible leader, and we're so lucky to, to work with you day in and day out. Um, Chelsea, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Chelsea Barnes. I'm the legislative director with Appalachian Voices. I've uh, worked a lot on our state policy work on solar energy and also um, now focus more on our federal work on abandoned mine land reclamation and economic development um, and, and work out of the Norton office with Robert and Adam. So nice to see you all. And Chelsea was the, the former me, the new her, um, and she's here um, to answer all the hard questions that might come up. So, well, thank you panelists. Um, it, it's so nice to just um, help steward a conversation between all of y'all, but really it's gonna be organic and we have some, some questions, but let's let the conversation just take us where it may. Um, Christine, you opened up by saying resilience is built on local ideas. And with that framing that was so powerful, I'm wondering if we can dive into what is a new economy and how does it get built on the resiliency of local ideas? Um, I'll turn it to you first, Christine, since it was your, your thought, and then we'll all just jump in as we may. Sure, thanks, Robert. Well, it's such a good question. And, and I think to go back a little bit, you know, how do we define resilience? Not to get stuck on that, but a lot of people, you know, you can look at environmental resilience. You know, what's the capacity of a watershed to absorb a, you know, 100 year, 1000 year storm? What's the ability of an economy to be able to withstand, you know, these rates, you know, of rising fuel costs right now, housing costs, food costs? What's the ability of a community to thrive in the future? Social, how do we stay strong as a community and region through a global pandemic? So these different ways we can look at resilience and, and through being involved over the last 20 years and a couple national scale projects where we've just listened. That's almost the way we start any project working with communities is to listen, to listen deeply, to listen deeply more and to pull threads of ideas together and regional scale projects where we've listened as well. What we found, and this is primarily in communities whose economies have relied on coal or natural resource extraction in some way, is that what really moves the needle is local ideas and local local leaders. And for spaces and places where folks can get together in a place that feels safe to them to share their ideas and work together. And what we've also seen is there are a couple circumstances, you know, we've seen across federal projects, state projects, and local projects, where an idea imposed from outside a community a couple times in examples that we've looked at, that's had legs and moved the needle and found traction, but usually not. What usually really creates change within communities is where folks get together at a kitchen table or a Zoom meeting that looks like Hollywood Squares and say, hey, what do you want to do? And, and I think a good example, which might come up, is uh, where I first met Louie Ann and Adam the Clinch River Valley Initiative, which I work on with the Institute for Engagement and Negotiation at the University of Virginia, folks talked about the Clinch River, which flows through Southwest Virginia for 100 miles, is one of the most biodiverse watersheds in the globe. And folks said, hey, you know, this is a, a river, but more broadly, a community that we love deeply. We've been baptized in the Clinch, we've wanted to swim in the Clinch, we know our neighbors up and down the river, and it can't be outsourced. A lot of partners talked about that, you know, attracting large scale businesses to the region and getting really far and at the last minute those businesses pull out and the promised jobs wouldn't come through. And so the Clinch River Valley Initiative or CRVI was a really fascinating long term example of how grassroots ideas 
where folks, so we love the clinch, local leaders, local ideas, but a place where people could come together, nurture those ideas and let them grow really is changing, has changed the narrative in a lot of ways. But I think that really one key distinction point is it's hard for people to join those spaces when they're having a hard time putting food on the table. So how do we create spaces where people can come together still and their ideas can still find traction or value? In my small world of facilitation, that often means like having food and child care or maybe elder care available community spaces or meetings. But I think just coming back to it, resilience is built on the local ideas of local leaders. We've seen that in so many examples and it, it's such a joy when people's, ah, when they light up and they spark, really it is a spark. They share those ideas and that spark goes on to others. It's really neat to see it happen. And many folks here are, are, are doing that in their work. Anyone else? Well, I'm, I, I'm never at a loss for words. Uh, so resiliency is, I looked it up. So Christine gave me some time to really get this definition down pat. Okay, so the capacity to recover quickly and a toughness. Now I'm gonna say this, um, not every community has the spirit of being tough because there's some issues that you have to deal with as you work through uh, becoming resilient and being determined to be resilient. And I want everybody to know that is work that's working in different communities that not every community is gonna be as resilient as some. And it's going to take some folks to be empowered in their own communities to, uh, Christine, I'm gonna coin your phrase, rise up and, um, and don't take no for an answer. And um, to be that tough person that you have to be, liked or unliked, let's put it that way, because not everybody is gonna like this. And um, so what we're trying to do here in my neck of the woods is we're trying to completely change things. And change comes and it's hard when you try to change things. And that's because, and that goes back to your word resilience. You're gonna need those folks with capacity to have resilience and a long time to wait through how your community is going to take that change and how we're going to pivot is my key word here into something else. Now that's not to say that we're going to strong arm anyone into taking on our mantra that we believe in, because that's why we're having this conversation because we have such diverse thinkers and we have diverse thinkers here at the table tonight. And that is the collaborative spirit that we all need to be working under uh, in today's tough times, because I know we all come with a certain mindset, a historically, passionately, ever what you want to call it, but we must have that determination, which goes back to resiliency and that tough skin um, to move the needle forward for the community. Now you can't take just one person and do it. So it's gonna take the village, in other words. And um, I have relied on the village and outside the village. And you try to bring, bring those folks to the table whether they like it or not. And what we learned with Curvy, I'm gonna go back and use that as an example. Um, what we learned with Curvy is there were folks that came to the table to have a conversation that had never had a conversation together ever. And we had a university our, uh, university arm here of UVA Wise and um, our uh, vice chancellor, Shannon Blevins, I'm gonna call her name cause I adore her. But she made the statement that she had been in the business world and had never worked across the line with the environmental world. And I came from um, a group called the Nature Conservancy. I guess everyone's heard of those folks, right? And so we learned by visioning through a process 20 some years ago that we were going to use the economy, the environment, and the community and create a, what we call the three-legged stool effect. And I have tucked that away and used that always. So when we circle back around and talk about this, that's how it all has to be, be in one. So when we talked about Curvy and the diversity of the community, we all started learning that a lot of people knew each other, but we had never had these tough conversations before. 
Thanks, Lou. Matt or Adam, do you have any thoughts? I want to jump in and talk about tough conversations. Um, I've had a lot of those lately. <laughs> um, as a uh, uh, grandson of a, a coal miner, my, my father-in-law is a coal miner, my brother-in-law is a coal miner, I've got my underground mining papers. Um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, of resistance to, to move towards uh, green energy. And, you know, I, I think a lot of it comes from the thought that we're going to replace all coal mines and all natural gas or whatever it might be with solar. And I, and I prefer to look at this more as a working hand in hand to supplement things. And these, these tough conversations that I've had with uh, a lot of folks who their history, their entire history, their entire family history, their home is tied up in what coal created. In reality, I don't think coal created it. It was the hard work of the people of the Appalachian Mountains who created it. And that's, you know, kind of where I'm, I've hit the ground running is trying to create more work. And really, like Lou said, not taking no for an answer. Uh, you can ask some folks that have been in contact with me. I, I've probably been at them for a year or more. And that's okay because, you know, time-wise, yeah, we're a little bit behind the eight ball. Northern Virginia and other places had uh, PPA laws and solar laws enacted way before we did. And now we're kind of starting at the ground floor of it. So I think tough conversations and uh, resiliency are all points of it. You know, we need to, to rise up and move forward and it's gonna take a village. It's gonna take all of us working together in Southwest Virginia. It's gonna take teachers and superintendents um, to basically move these things forward, business leaders, and I think uh, there's a bright future ahead of us. I just think it's going to take a little time to get there. Um, but yeah. Thanks, Matt. Oh, this is so fun. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to add some layers here. Um, we've been talking about um, <clears throat> asset based community development with the Clinch River Valley Initiative and, and how essential that is for what the new economy looks like. Um, and like that looks like there's this. I wish we could do screen share. We didn't do slides, we normally do slides. There's this caboose um, in uh, downtown St. Paul that um, you know, was a coal train caboose. It's now the headquarters of a um, river outfitter where you can go rent a kayak or some tubes and float down the Clinch River. And that, like, that is what the new economy looks like. Um, we talked about what Matt just talked about with our transition to solar and the need to um, to use solar as one of the many energy producing ways that, that Southwest Virginia continues to retain that proud legacy of an energy region. Um, and so I'm gonna add another one of um, manufacturing and manufacturing related to coal um, and how that uh, can look like in the new economy. And this is rooted in, um, so the Solar Work Group of Southwest Virginia, someone put the link to the, the website in the chat role, swbasolar.org. Lots of awesome stuff happening there. Um, to really summarize, we've like been focusing a lot on uh, jobs related to manufacture, jobs related to installation of solar panels, uh, which is great. And that's what Matt's been talking about in the work he's been doing. Um, our region has a strong history in uh, manufacturing, though. And so from the very beginning days of that work, we've wanted to know, well, could we make something related to the solar industry? Uh, and so we did some some analysis, did some studies. And long story short, the answer <clears throat> was sure. And it, it's something in the energy storage field. Um, and so what that looks like, what the new economy looks like in man man manufacturing space is there's several manufacturers that used to make coal related stuff related to underground mining, which is all electrified. It's been electrified for generations because you can imagine you don't want to be running a diesel engine, you know, a mile underground. It can lead to bad things. So in a way, Southwest Virginia was a pioneer in the electrification movement that we're now seeing, you know, that needs to happen rapidly for decarbonization. So one of the things we're working on now is working with partners to help those manufacturers take what they're really expert at making electrified heavy duty stuff and apply that technology to um, solar and storage uh, batteries setups, um, electric car setups, other um, electrification infrastructure stuff. It's a lot of the same technology, a lot of the same machines making that stuff, but instead of making it for underground coal mining, they're making it for the new electrified economy. Um, so that's another thing, another way that the new economy looks like in Southwest Virginia that we're working towards. 
Thanks, Adam. That was a, a good pivot. I actually was going to see if others want to raise some successes that we've had over the last few years or what we're building now. Well, here I go again. Um, the, the success around natural uh, assets or nature based assets or whatever we have here is, um, you know, previously under um, a large corporate body, you're you're working with that uh, that corporation, whatever it may be. Uh, today, I'm the coal lady. So this is coal country. And that's what we're referring to. But it can be any big business anywhere. And all the ancillary feeders that work with that create businesses too. And so we all become dependent on these huge bodies of corporate America, which is fine, by the way. And that's wonderful as long as it's working. But what happens there is we forget who we really are and that that we forget that entrepreneurial spirit and what we had to do here in in southwest virginia namely in the little town of st paul that i've worked in um we had to recreate the idea of an entrepreneurial spirit because no the that that had we had empty building building after building after building was either empty or falling down now is that that is part of what goes on in my world but if you translate that to another city, another place, you see that all over America because we are uh, pivoting and shifting away from different types of business. How we do business today is not the same as how we did business 10 years ago or even 50 years ago. So when you start talking about how to make things different, how to do things and change your community, you've got to start changing the whole thing. So you got to change how we do business now and how we think. So that comes back to creating what have you got to work with? What's left to work with? And so if you have natural assets that you can work off of and start feeding off of those, then you can create a little success. And what we've done here is we created a success story that builds on success that begins to breed success. And then you have all these other elements come together and, um, and piece it all together in a beautiful way that you didn't even see coming. And, and I don't wanna make it complicated, but let's just take for instance, the caboose with the outfitter. That was a pivotal moment for us to have an outfitter and float the Clinch River, which is the most biodiverse river we claim, uh, second to the Amazon. And like I say to everyone, you'll have to prove me wrong with that. Um, so it, it's a, you know, if you look at the Nature Conservancy's map, it's the hottest little spot in all of North America. And we say, how did we get to be that way with the ills of coal industry? So there, there's answers to all that too, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about how to create the new economy here and what we're using to do that. And so when we started building on that success, apparently people in Appalachia and I'm an I'm a native Appalachia never lived anywhere else but Southwest Virginia and apparently you have to be shown that you can be successful at various things uh, I mean Matt's over here laughing I, I you know if the volume was on you're probably laughing your rear off but anyway because it's true because <laughs> it's, it's so true, true. And I think everybody is from Missouri you got to show them um, so little successes had to be shown and the, the more success now I got people calling me saying, Hey, I got this idea. I had a little, we got a little nurse next door that left the nursing profession as hot as the market is in nursing and started her a bakery. I'm like, girl, you gotta be crazy. She said, I love this because some people just can't take the stress of that profession. God knows we need them. I'm an old woman. I need all the nursing I can get. But you know, what I'm saying here is these things are, are happening all over and people are pivoting away from what they were doing and finding strength in loving where they are because we were all trying to run from Appalachia. Now we're all trying to run back because it's the coolest thing ever. And we're doing all this cool stuff because we're rethinking how our economy acts and feels. Thanks, Lou. If the other panelists can, you can give some philosophy, but give real examples of some successes that you've built so folks can know we're celebrating right now. I'm happy to share one. Mm -hmm. Matt, do you want to go ahead? 
No, go right ahead. Go right ahead. Well, so some philosophy and some real hands-on practical tactical. Quick. I think that there are a couple of themes that I just want to draw out, not necessarily answers. I'll look to the story of Dan Gannon, which is one of my very favorite stories to share about regions working together. But I think there are a couple of things. Lou talked about toughness earlier. I think about grit. I think there's a real element of grit and not being afraid to work hard. That's really important and unique in communities, and I've seen this across the Midwest and the West too, coal-based communities, other natural resource extraction communities, it's folks who aren't afraid to work hard. There's a real element of that, that in building a new economy and a transition in economy where an entire sector dries up. It's not about whether people want it to or not, it's just an entire sector dries up for a number of reasons. Grit is really important. The ability of, for a community to not only bounce back, but bounce forward, and Adam and I have talked about this a bit before. What happens in that learning from the bounce back to the bounce forward, that struggle, that really hard struggle, what do people learn? And how do you take that learning and apply it to where you're going to go? And that's where I think one of the challenges also, you know, at least, you know, in my experience, there's a very strong sense of self-reliance and very strong lived experience of self-reliance, yet, as Lou mentioned, there's a very strong mindset shift towards creating entrepreneurial communities because there have been companies that have provided jobs. And there's a very great sense of fear of those jobs being gone and not necessarily a mindset in place on how do we build a job ourselves. That's a total mindset shift that when UVA's College at Wise started the entrepreneurship programs, my Southwest Virginia opportunity, you know, they really, they're looking at the mindset was a really big part of that. And fear will shut you down. So I think that working in regions, working as communities, you know, Lou talked about success builds success. And I think it absolutely has to take place. And what was so fascinating in the town of Dungannon, which is what, Lou, seven miles from St. Paul? About 11, maybe. Yes, you're close. Uh -huh. um, down river. Um, there's a, a small community where there was a former mayor who, Again, going back to the Clint River Valley Initiative, there was some discussion in the town about wanting to join up with the Clint River Valley Initiative. And that mayor at the time said, things are never going to change. There's no point trying. We're going to become a retirement community. We might as well just continue on. Well, that mayor was elected out and Mayor Deborah Horn was elected in. She, you know, even says, you know, I wasn't even registered to vote. I'm not from Dungan and who's going to vote for me? But she had passion burning in her heart to be able to create opportunities for kids in Dungannon and to create a playground. And that was a really substantial driving point for her. But she said, where do I start? So she talked to Luann. She talked with other people in the Clint River Valley Initiative. And hearing about how Luann and the town of Cleveland, you know, how they were able to get a small grant to be able to start recycling. You know, they started applying for a $3,000 grant and then a $10,000 grant and then success spread success. And then Mayor Horn did not feel like she and the other folks on the management team were acting alone. They were acting as a region. Louie-Ann has her back. She doesn't have to worry about whether she's going to fail or not because there are other people in the community who have their back when needed. And she relied on that. How do I do this? How do I move forward? And slowly over time, they have hit tons of hurdles over time that they've been working. But they have acquired substantial funding. I don't know, a million, over a million dollars of now grant funding to transform the downtown based on the ideas from within Duncan and not imposed from the outside. But talk about grit. That is one example where um, Mayor Horn wasn't afraid to ask hard questions and didn't feel like she had to get it right because she was working in partnership with others across the region to learn how to do it. And then through learning how to do it and working in partnership to create change. And it really has, it, it's part of, you know, it's cliche, but a rising tide. But that doesn't mean that it's easy, um, it's still difficult. What would others add, add to this question or practical examples? Yeah, just real quick. Um, thanks, everyone who um, is dropping questions in the chat. That's really uh, appreciated. Um, you can use the Q&A function, too. We will have a few minutes, 10 to 15 minutes uh, at the end to, to dive into your questions. So go ahead and feel free to keep dropping them in. Um, Matt or Adam, do you want to um, add some successes to our, our list here? I mean, I'll 
kind of throw in some successes. Um, you know, my successes are doing the first schools in Southwest Virginia with solar. I mean, come on, that's that never was going to happen. I took this job. And I have a friend who's a president of a marketing company in Richmond. And he said, you know, you're fighting an uphill battle if you take this. And you know, it's going to be extremely difficult. And I said, yeah, but here's the thing. I moved to Charlottesville and I worked in Richmond for over a year. I came back home. I have a nine-year-old daughter. I want her to be able to stay here because it seems like most local kids their goal is to leave. We don't want them to leave. We want them to stay and do things like what Lou is talking about, the entrepreneurial spirit in the area. I mean, you know, we're going to have jobs this summer. I'm going to have a solar job that's going to allow a kid to go get training, college credits, and possibly buy their first car off of working and learning a new trade. Now, that's not only a trade that they can work on here. That's a trade that they can take and go anywhere. They don't even have to use those college credits to become a solar person. They can use those college credits to become a master electrician, which we all know is super duper needed right now. You know, but you take that same success and you look back at other successes that inspired me to think that I could be a success in this. And you look at spearhead trails. Okay. I've been a lifelong ATV and motorcycle rider. I know that kind of goes contrary with what I do for a living, but hey, that's who I am. And um, so I've ridden motorcycles and razors and ATVs, and I have ridden spearhead trails multiple times. I bought a razor, uh, go to the uh, pub down there, um, Sugar Hill. If you've never been there, please go try out Sugar Hill. It's amazing. These, the owners are awesome. Live music on a pretty regular basis. But that comes back into the rising tide brings all ships. If I, if I succeed and I get more than just these two, which I will, that's no doubt about it. It's not if. It's when, and when I succeed, and when we get a better workforce options for the, for kids here, there's going to be more kids that stay, and there's going to be more kids that open shops like Lab Twenty Sports down in uh, St. Paul. There's going to be oh yes, they do make very high quality beverages. Thank you, Ed. <laughs> um, and you know those things will breed more and more success as we see uh, and and we go forward. The STEM learning that's that's coming out, we're going to see more folks. Mm -hmm. stay here. We've seen the remote re uh, revolution, if you will, in my opinion, where people will not go back into an office if they can stand it. And a lot of those people are moving here, according to some of my realtor friends. We are seeing slow population growth. And as long as we stay with our success, breed success, I think we're going to see a big uh, renaissance in Appalachia in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. Robert, I've, I've got a success story I want to talk about in just a minute, and I promise I won't take up much time because I'm notorious for that. Um, we had a little program happen here on the clinch called uh, a group came in from Orange County, Virginia, and uh, stream sweepers. And we all pitched in money, we meaning the governments, um, St. Paul, Russell County, uh, various folks gave money to bring them here and, and put them on the river to clean up. In the meantime, they hired, going back to what Matthew's talking about, they hired our area youth out of high school. And um, these, these young men and women were just, they worked like you've never seen. They come out, they look like they've been mud wrestling by the end of the day, soaking wet, beautiful children, young, young folks and and one in particular um, rose to the top and she worked for Stream Sweepers for two years. She attended Radford University. She has a degree. She's an intern right now for Russell County Tourism. So that little Russell County girl was able to work with Stream Sweepers and she received some scholarships and uh, helped her move through her uh, university years and now she's interning at the county level and will probably more than likely, fingers crossed, will become our tourism director and our DMO uh, that sits on the board for Heart of Appalachia. This is huge. This is huge for me. This is huge for my county. This is an example of the brain drain that we're trying to stop and have those folks have opportunity. And if we don't build that opportunity off of what we've got left here, which is what we should have been doing all along, 
but we, we just lost sight of that somehow along when the big box stores came along and listen, I'm a Walmart, Target, Costco, whatever you want to say, shopper. But when we lost our downtowns and we lost that living in the downtown and having a viable, vibrant area to come to, um, then people migrated to bigger metropolis metropolises. And we like to say we're cosmopolitan around here. So uh, anyway, thanks for letting me share that story. Yeah, no, thank you, Lou. That's it's a beautiful story. Adam? Yeah, it is. And I was thinking, um, and this was a, like Christine mentioned, um, Mayor Horn, uh, Matt has mentioned th these like to, to be individuals, high school students. And it's like, it's about individuals, like the, the new economy and success. Like we like to paint these big, you know, oh, we did so many big numbers of big things, but it really, it comes down to like one person at a time. I think like so many of, of our successes of Appalachian Voices and collectively within Southwest Virginia, you can look at like a couple of people that got together and really moved the needle based on relationships one-to-one. -one. Um, and so I just, I think that's, we're all nodding our heads because um, it's, it's true. Um, I wanna try and do something here. Ed um, put a question in here in, in the chat. And I, I know because I have the questions from that Robert sent us that one of the questions is what are the biggest challenges that we're facing? So I'm gonna try and do two things at once here. We'll see if it works. Um, so I'll read Ed's question aloud. Our state and federal policy should be focused on new economy jobs for Appalachia's poorest regions. It's clear that bottom-up development is working, but we need more state and federal policies that support such development. Does anyone know some such policies um, that might succeed getting into law? Um, so a couple of answers there. One is um, Robert led our work uh, in the General Assembly session this year, working to get um, funding for the Department of Housing and Community Development to put dollars into um, local communities through planning districts um, or through the DHCD to provide capacity uh, to localities, small towns, counties, to get some federal and state dollars deployed doing um, economic community development projects. Um, so that's one policy at the state level that we hope gets funded and gets more capacity on the ground. That tees up my next, the biggest challenge is it's this challenge of abundance um, where right now there has never been more federal money available for economic development, especially in coal impacted communities across the country. And that's largely through the um, bipartisan infrastructure law or the bill, some people call it, um, that was passed recently that just infused so many uh, federal agencies with just billion, literally billions of dollars of cash. Um, Awesome, great, and and we've you know everyone on this call that you can see has been uh, hard at work in some cases multiple times trying to get some of that money and bring it into Southwest Virginia to to realize a new economy. Um, the problem is that it's the opportunity is just so big and our local capacity relatively so small that that capturing that money, bringing it down, and applying it to projects that have that vision, local ideas, local leaders, as Christina said, that's the real challenge. I think everyone that you see here has really stepped up in major ways to face that challenge. But I think if that's like the defining moment of like the next couple of years is, is will we successfully take that money, which is really a, a once in a lifetime opportunity and do good on it? Because it, it could be our, our best and last chance to really jumpstart the new economy in, into the next phase of, of development. And we can't count on another infusion of billions and billions of dollars. So we've got to get it right this time. What do others think? Challenges? I think capacity. that, Lou, do you wanna go ahead? No, all I need to say is capacity. Adam understands, I think everybody does. I don't have I was, that capacity. I was gonna say the exact same thing. I think that some kind of circuit rider, I don't know if that's the right term, but I think that there needs to be regional capacity builders that can work across federal agencies to lend assistance to nonprofits and state localities, planning district commissions, uh, you know, different levels of agencies. It's a model that's been used in watershed work, we really call watershed circuit riders. That's the only way I know the term of circuit rider. Um, when you have a locality where the county administrator is looking at building permits and budgets 
and hiring and reports and zoning laws you know, there just simply is not the human time to be able to have a good cup of coffee in the morning and do all those things and capitalize on the federal funding that's coming in the door right now. Um, Ed, that's a great question about should those circuit riders be located and found within nonprofits. What we've heard from an independent kind of facilitation perspective is that long term anchor institutions serve a very strong role in regional um economic development you know sustainability regeneration so i think it depends on the region you know in southwest virginia the first thing that comes to mind would be uva's college at wise or the community colleges um someone who could be in kind of a quasi academic slash community role but not somebody who's out of touch with the local communities but it's going to look different in different places in west virginia maybe that's an existing institution like the west virginia community development hub who's already knows the network and local players. That's just an idea, but I think capacity is a really significant element that funders don't often see that and siloed federal agencies often don't see that as well. Um, to go back to those, the question earlier about policy, one thing that I've been really impressed by the work group, the solar work group is that there's a challenge, solar won't move forward without addressing the policy challenge. Some people have stepped aside and said, we are not able to engage in policy development with our, you know, the way that we're set up structurally. So it's okay for them to step aside. Multiple years, policy change work has happened. And in some of those years, there's a win, but it's not a one-shot deal, like grant opportunities. It's not often a one-shot deal. Sometimes it's a multiple win or the multiple need. So just a, just a couple different thoughts there, but there are a lot of challenges. <laughs> Yeah, and I'll, I'll jump in on those challenges from first hand. Um, you know, I spend a lot of my time reaching out to community leaders, to uh, superintendents, facilities directors. You would be amazed at how many emails those folks get, <laughs> how many phone calls they get. Um, and, and my best uh, successes come with warm introductions from some of the folks you see here. Um, you know, and especially once they find out I'm local, I'm in Wise, Virginia, Lou, I'm what, 20 minutes away from where you sit. Um, I can drive anywhere and go meet somebody in person, but to even get to that point, it takes a local introduction for someone else to say, Hey, this guy's worth your time. This guy's worth your time to speak to give him 15 minutes, because even though I may have went near someone who was a principal to me at some point in time. I still can't get their attention, even though I was a student of theirs because, and it's not for lack of them wanting to talk to me. It's the fact that they're smothered by a million other things. And, you know, I don't, I, I don't take any offense to it, but that's, you know, firsthand knowledge of the challenges of getting here. Folks are overwhelmed right now, whether it's with cares money for schools or like you went over Christine with the, uh, with one person doing 40 different jobs. There's just not enough human time. So yeah, I think something could be done and nonprofit folks that I've worked with have all been awesome. I mean, really awesome people and they're doing good work. Um, and people like Lou who, you know, help me with get introductions and things of those nature. That's helping things move forward. And it, it happens as a community and with per personal knowledge and personal introductions. Um, but again, that goes back to what we talked about earlier. It comes from the individual. So, yeah, and I'm going to jump right in on that tag on that one from Matthew. But um, <clears throat> what I have found is um, the nonprofit world and probably the business world that I live in, it moves at a different pace. And when I became um, politically active, I guess you could say, whatever I am. I still call myself a servant, even though I'm elected by the people, but I entered another world that is, is, it's okay. And it's rewarding, but it moves at the pace of a dead snail. And this, you know, I'm, I'm like, I'm running out of life. People stop this. I don't know how you do stop the merry go round. I got to get off cause I got things to do. And I got friends on the screen that I'm looking at and I call them up and, and, and I'm sorry, but I use you badly. And 
because I can't go any further. And I've learned that the, the, the nonprofit world, that's where we've got to go. I mean, we, we just, I'm sorry, the government may have all the money or whatever, but we got to figure this out because this is, this is crude. This is our critical time, our pivotal time. And I'm going to be quiet again. Thank you for letting okay. me say that. Yeah, no, thanks. So I'm going to say one of the successes over the last seven years, but even going before that has been there's an ecosystem built now where there's collaboration that happens day to day and Lou is able to hit up app voices or dialogue and design or secure futures. And we're able to quickly sort of wrap our heads around an opportunity and we're able to pull some all nighters and take advantage of um, some of the solutions. And that is because there's an ecosystem that has been built over time in these deep relationships. I wanna to get to two things in the chat. You know, um, to Ed's point around Appalachian School of Law, I can't speak to their full vision, but they recently published a report around um, cleaning up GOB and sort of the efforts and opportunities around that. So maybe they're looking at their role as um, a, an incubator of economic diversification and, and, um, and movement. So I think that's a great resource. And then Peggy dropped a question in about the administration, about the um, Youngkin administration. I'll take the first stab, but if others have a better answer, so please jump in. And Peggy, I think the answer for you, for that question is it's a little too soon for us to, to fully understand how the administration is approaching um, the coal fields and rural economic development. I will say um, we've turned to DHCD around this coal field community development proposal, and they were all in for it, and they helped us strengthen that um, legislative proposal. They, I, I have been doing some work behind the scenes to see that work happen. And again, if that does happen, that's two new employees at DHCD that's gonna be in the coal field region and they're only gonna be doing capacity building and hopefully doing it in the smallest communities first. And, and we'll have a role in implementing that. I think the Youngkin administration understands that rural Virginia showed up and elected them and they have um, an indebtedness to rural Virginia. And I think we'll see that play out but it's too soon right now to, to see um, where that's going. Um, anyone else have anything to say about um, the, our new administration or Appalachia School of Law? Well, I do, of course. Um, Appalachia <laughs> School of Law is a great resource, but you know, I have used, I'm gonna say it again, Virginia Tech, the Community Design Assistance Team. Um, uh, we've used Radford University, uh, Ferrum College has been a great friend to us in Southwest Virginia. And of course, um, the University of Virginia College at Wise and the Mothership UVA. So these are all people and places that have been very kind to us and we have used those. And they, they, um, they, they look for, they call a lot and say, look, I've got this intern that needs to do X, Y, Z. And have you got anything? And we try to put them, we try to put them in, connections with our communities and those those folks that can use that so we've as as they've said before we've been building this coalition this team of people and um we've we've kind of gone from one piece to the other some drop off some stay on we add more friends and that's how we've done a lot of things that's happening now that's great successes uh big successes uh and so we're all excited to be part of that Thanks, Lou. I, we're down to our last four minutes here. Um, I want to also say, you know, we've worked with Emory Henry College as well. Ed is here and he's throwing out these questions. So I just want to give them a plug as well in their Appalachia Center. Um, I'm actually working with them to think about some work their students could be doing. Um, if you have questions, please drop them in and we'll, we'll get to them. But round robin real quick, y'all. Um, what's next? What's coming up? Um, if you had the power to change some stuff overnight, like what would it be? sort of several questions there, um, and we'll go quickly. I'll jump in first, if that's all right. Um, I would like to say uh, widespread community solar um, with uh, something easy to get to um, so that our lower disadvantaged, uh, disadvantaged is the wrong word, um, people who just don't have a whole lot of money right now. You know, like they, they can get access to power. It's not costing them an arm, arm and a leg, you know, whether you're young, you're old, whatever. And then I'm going to add to that virtual net metering. You know, we've got multiple businesses that can take advantage of this stuff. This isn't hard. 
Um, this isn't something that's impossible to do, and it's not something that's really going to hurt anybody. Um, and I'm not saying that because I'm in a solar shirt or I work for a solar company. I'm saying that because I want to see prosperity here. Again, I want my daughter to live here and stay here so I don't have to move again to another area. I love Southwest Virginia, and I love the people here. And that's it. That's not Six nap. I would say um, for me, it's really simple. I think that the last two years have been just really, really challenging for people at a deep level. And I think that it looks like saying hi to your neighbor. And I think it involves looking people in the eye and like smiling and asking how they're doing and being willing to listen to see how folks are. Um, I think it's really a combination of being willing to work in community and individually for what that looks like and to really prioritize self-care and what brings us joy because what's coming ahead is not going to be easy either you know when we're just starting to see the rock and roll and change in times that are coming so i think that really those things about stabilizing our own selves and our families and our communities first um is really part of what i'm I'm seeing, and also, you know, but like this group brings me joy. So this this group is a priority for me. I make extra time for this group because it's something that is really important to me. So I prioritize it out of choice. I'll go next. Um, my mind just went far, Robert, when you asked that question. I want to see electrified high-speed rail in all of our communities. I want to see the train tracks that go, uh, you know, through a lot of people's front yards, including um, the house that my granddaddy built when he got home from the war. I want to see those trains carrying people to places powered by renewable energy sources and Appalachia leading the way in the um, transportation revolution that like we're just seeing the very beginning of. That's my big idea. Lou? I guess I'm, I'm next, right? Yep. Um, so I'm, I'm really hoping, I'm going to be a, probably a little more deeper than that. Um, I like all the things, the, the hands-on things, but I think that we need to be um, I think more, more open, um, diverse opinions, and be able to be collaborative together. Um, this is something that I'm hoping for. And I see that coming and it's working, but I'm that's that's my main goal is is to be the in, in that um, arena, I guess. Thanks everyone. Robert, I see your question and, and I'm gonna ask um, the panelists to maybe answer it in a second if they want to, but I wanna say to everyone, thank you so much for joining us tonight. This is just the start of a conversation. Again, throughout the year, Appalachian Voices will be hosting many conversations across all of our different types of work. And we welcome you to join us all along. I know it's eight o'clock and folks have to hop off, so feel free to, but I do want to um, turn the question over maybe to Adam. Um, you know, folks who are outside of the region doing, um, who are watching the work, how can they, how can they support us? One important way is um, through time and expertise and showing up for a long time before you give that expertise. Um, there's some good examples of people from outside the region who have first shown up and listened and then listened and listened and then asked, how can I help? And here's what I have to offer in terms of expertise and resources. Uh, I think that involves relationship building and understanding the work that's being done on the ground and then figuring out who to ask and how to plug in. And so I think if, if the desire is to do something that's not monetary and, and there are resources or expertise, it's it'll take a while, but it, it is needed. And there are some good examples to point to of ways that that's really gone a long way uh, in Southwest Virginia. It's a great answer. Panelists, thank you so much for your time, your energy, and your passion. We appreciate you, and your work is uh, not in vain. It's making much progress. Again, thank you all for joining us tonight. We'll see you again soon. Please be well, and we'll chat later. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you all. Thanks, friends. Appreciate y'all's time. <laughs>